Hello and welcome, to all prospective listeners, to episode three of our review of Murky Number Seven. This is your host Vex Tosca, and my co-hosts. Um... Did you forget our names? Yes, Barry. Say something. No. All right, my my co-hosts, uh, Kairos. See, I even use your name, you don't say anything, and Yasarian. Oh, I thought we were still going in order of the uh, the icon <laughs> order. Like, All right. I thought that's how we, I thought that's how we'd always done it. I don't know anymore. We don't have, I didn't type a procedure. Oh, we're just as organized as always. What an excellent start. Do we get to do three takes? <laughs> So in this episode of Red, Red Eye Airwaves, we'll be reviewing Chapter 3, Forlorn Hope. In this chapter, uh, this is after Murky has been pawned off on his new master, but right before he's taken away, and Murky comes up with a plan. Oh the yeah, plan. I forgot. The entire chapter is one day. That's a uh, perspective. I think the book so far has been maybe about a week to two weeks. I no, yes. it's been three days. Three yeah. days. Oh, it has geez. been three days. Yep. Just three. I wonder if they are going to institute a time skip at any point. Um, we'll see. I guess. I feel like chapter six, definitely. Maybe not. So to start it off, Murky's finally decided to rage against the machine. He has eschewed his slave personality and will craft an elaborate escape scheme to get out alive. Which is amazing because he's uneducated, so this could not possibly go wrong. <laughs> well, he got some tips. That's true. He does have the pip bot. One thing that um, I noticed that I hadn't noticed, if it was mentioned previously, but that his mom's at Shattered Hoof. Yeah, uh, that's where they were separated at. There's no guarantee that she's still there, but that's the last place they were together. Shattered Hoof has all of the raiders in FOE, doesn't it? Or is it not gone into? I might be thinking of a different place. I keep confusing Shattered Hoof with Huffington. I was very confused right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not 100% sure. It's been a while since I read the original book. Well, she attacks like a train car yard at one point, but I forget the name of it. I don't think it's Shattered Hoof. That's the... Uh, uh, the first train depot that she goes to is the town. And the second one is the big uh, slaver depot where she meets back up with Velvet. Yeah. Right. Okay. That might be um. That might be the analogous to Evergreen Mills and Fallout Three, more than Shattered Hope. Awesome. Possibly. I have no idea. I never played it. But at least we have a confirmation that um, at least he thinks his mother is alive, more or less. Well, yeah. It's it's only been blank number of years. I doubt it. No, I'm not going to kill off his mother. That would devastate him. <laughs> Maybe only at the most opportune moment. Yeah, he's got to meet her first, so that way he can watch. Yeah, exactly. Also learned that a um, apparently somebody fr some pony from Ten Pony Tower came to go buy a slave. Okay, so that was chapter three then. Yep, that was the, um, I think he mentions it in passing as a librarian looking for somebody to clean. Yep. I think he's talking in, like, um, retrospect, though, so it was probably before Red Eye's army whole bit. Yeah. Um, that one paragraph in which he mentions it um, had a different tone to it. Almost like he was, again, addressing the audience like he did with the one section prior. 
anyway, um, this is just after it's revealed that there's a Pegasus, or that he is a Pegasus, but nobody knows that it's him. It's just after the Pegasus incident in the mall, and as they begin clean up from Little Pip's escape, so he is working near the roller coaster where they're disassembling the broken chunks, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Which I don't really mm -hmm. understand what's going on there in that scene. What exactly is he? What's his part in all of that? Um, his part is they harness him to the collapsing structure that's teetering and ready to fall over, and then he pulls it over. Now yeah, he's probably not old. doing that himself, but you know he's one of many people that are harnessed to a large um, teetering metal scaffolding that held up the roller coaster tracks and then they have to pull it over until it starts falling and then they have to get out of the way quick otherwise they'll drop it on themselves uh, control demolition and all that yep it's important jo uh, an important job to rebuild Equestria new anyway he meets the mail the orange mail yep she uh, she rescues him again Many times, <laughs> he pushes as, him out uh, of the way as a um. I'm sorry, I mean to cut you off. No, no. I mean, you're just gonna fill in for me. It's um, the chunk of track that gets cut free from above, and then he gets stuck in his harness, and she knocks him out of the way. Amuses me to think of all these slaves, kind of like. It's a roller coaster, is it? Yeah. Like dotted around this roller coaster, eating it with auto axes, slowly tearing it down. No fun allowed. Um, he actually goes into it. Point but is... they're using. Um, like grappling saddles to get up the side. Is that like a Dr. Octagonopus kind of No, thing? it's like a battle saddle, but with grappling hooks instead. Oh. Like um, Attack on Titan, I think. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm imagining like a horse swinging from the ceiling on a grappling hook. So the they, um, I'm... I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say the one thing I wanted from that conversation was her name, because it's annoying to just refer to her by her main color or whatever, coat color, I can't remember. What if, what if she dies and we never learn it? I'll be very sad forever. That'd be, that'd be hilarious. I think her, um, like, as far as in general, she's just addressed as the mayor. We could name her. Do they finally mm. talk about her cutie mark? I don't remember. I don't think so. Nope. And what's what color That's is her it. coat? Um, a creamy yellow coat and a light orange mane tinged with red. Creamy girl. Let's call her Sunrise. See, I like that one. That's okay. Coffee? Coffee? Thinking of cream. <laughs> okay. You're thinking of creamer. Yeah, but creamer is not. A... I suppose it could be. Sunrise works. Alright, the marriage now officially named Sunrise. If it's not Sunrise, I will uh, I'll be very angry. <laughs> she looks more at, um,. Some of Murky's drawings after saving his uh, weak tiny butt again. And this time we learn that Murky has absolutely zero shots with her because she's already waiting for somebody else. Oh, uh, yeah. A cooler, stronger, hotter stallion. Who doesn't need to be saved. Who is probably 100% dead or. Yeah. Murky's gonna meet him. He might kill him. Might find him dead. Yeah, Murky might inadvertently get him killed. What if they 
What if he goes to, um, not to spoil it, but kind of on the end of this chapter, what if he goes on one of his little project runs in his newfound job and finds his dead body? <laughs> oh. Well, um, the mayor said that they were planning to escape together, so working the job that earns you your freedom wouldn't help her escape. Well, I'm, I'm not wondering because, um, the master originally came to find somebody for the job, and like there he's forcefully picking people. So I wonder if some people in the um, the escape attempt of the riots weren't volunteered for it. I don't think the master is looking for um, because uh, Regini was there looking for more people to join protege. The master came there on his own initiative, looking for something else for himself. Oh. That's why they had that back and forth. So, I, I, if uh, it was, if he was recruited by the Master, I don't think he necessarily went to work um, for Protégé. So he was just that close to being put in like a cute maid outfit or something? And he threw it all away? Yeah, or whatever the Master's into, I guess. Or I guess I should say chain link shackles because he he's the only one who refers to himself as the master. No, Moki does. Yeah, but Murky doesn't count. So Pegasus, come on, doesn't have voting lights. I gotta say, I'm surprised Murky hasn't been shot yet. <laughs> he's the most useless of any pony. And the times he's not useless, he kind of just pisses off every slaver he ever comes into contact with. Like, it just he's so subservient that he just pisses them off. Well, I think um, it's because he's so weak and scrawny that they enjoy physically beating him. You know, he's more fun as a punching bag. Also, if you could literally kill him with a single punch, you really don't need to waste ammo on him. One punch. Yeah, but it's target practice. So, he is tiny and quick. Relatively. I feel like you're jumping ahead here. <laughs> so he gets done talking to her. And uh, why I brought that up, because when the slavers come to um, split them up, he dashes and takes a whiplash that she should have taken. Yep. Brave of him. Which... I'm surprised that would have been a perfect moment to be like, this is what happens when you try to intervene, and they hit her a couple more times, more so because he had intervened. Yeah, and because they can't take it out on him because he's the master's new prize. Though I'm just evil. But that I think... Point. I guess they had more work to do, and they were busy trying to keep all of the other slaves who were tearing the thing down organized, so they just didn't have time for it, to make an example. I think that would have organized them, too. I think it would have distracted them as they all stopped to stare. But... And as the slavers split him up, he yells back one final time, What's your name? We shall never know. What's your number? 24601. Two, four, no? six, oh, one. Thank you. <laughs> that is perfect for this, isn't it? I don't know what that is, but I'll um, go with sure. Les Miserables, uh, they're prisoners. Um, during the, what was it, French Revolution, something like that? Yep. And uh, the main character, or one of the main characters, uh, Jean Valjean, is a prisoner for stealing bread for his family, if I remember correctly. I and think so. the person, uh, basically the slaver, or the person running his little prison group, uh, kind of hates him. And it's Lesbian Diablos as a musical. So he sings to him, Prisoner 24601. Oh something along those lines. And they, they do a little sing dance bit while they lift a ship. And it's really a good movie. Okay. <laughs> 
But it's a g great comparison to Murky Number Seven. <laughs> They're slaves, slavers. Um, you know, song and dance numbers here and there. It's it's it all uh, it all holds up. Um, gotcha. So immediately after that, he is sent back to the fun farm. I think it time skips to him like um having crawled off to No 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 it is the fun farm. I'm sorry, I I got a little bit ahead of myself there. Cause that's yeah. when he steals the whip from Whiplash. Petting zoo. Okay, the petting zoo. That's the specific location. And you gotta share you gotta care as mentioned. Yeah, because uh I think he picked it up on the the pit buck. Sorry, Sundial, but if I hadn't figured out how to turn that off, I might have just smashed your pit buck in an effort to preserve my sanity. Uh, season one memes. The best. Oh, that's a really good question. Depending on how, because Murky only ended recently, so topically, a lot of its references could, could be up to date. When did it start? Started... 2012, I believe. 2012, August 31st. And ended... 2016. December of 2016. So we have up until, I think, um... Season 6? Season 5? It'll it, take. If he ever yeah, leaves Philadelphia will. for the references to matter. <laughs> but you, you really noticed, uh... The, the references. Uh, I've noticed several, many. That was one of my... F I've... Go ahead, sorry. Uh, well, they, they slightly take me out of it, honestly. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's this is a very depressing, sad story, and the references not exactly, you know, contrast with it, but in a good way, it, they don't, they just, ah, they take me out of it, they make me think of better times. <laughs> I like to see how it's been warped in the lens of um, the apocalypse, it's the pinky balloons just repeating all the music on loop, it gets me more invested, to be honest. Oh no, no, that's, that's great, I like that part, I mean the actual references, the fan references, that sort of thing. What do you mean? Uh, there were a bunch. Uh, can't recall any right now, but you know, there were a bunch of uh, jokes in it. Oh, like tiny yeah. one liners? Yeah, uh, if I'm saying just. Uh, I can't recall any right now, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Like sticking in, um, sticking in, I don't know. Lyra sitting. I don't, it, it, it's not there, but you know. It's a thing. I'll stop talking. I think I know what you're talking about. Um, I feel like that was more chapter four, though. Oh, sorry. Whoops. <laughs> I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know. We're going to go back through it, so we'll find out. Let's see. So he steals the whip and gets caught while stealing it comes up with a brilliant explanation that just seems to deflect all criticism, and that is uh, Whiplash, ne or not Whiplash, uh, Wicked Slit needs us. Yeah. I, I personally really like how he's shaping up to be a great little thief. <laughs> he, it's, uh, he, he's finally utilizing his small body structure and silent hooves, sort of, uh, to gain some sort of advantage. I knew I know it would get tiresome eventually, but I wish for all of the FOE novels if they kept a running tally of all the previous perks whenever a new perk was gained. Make like make it nicer to not not just like the full description of each one each time, but at least the words and a list. Yeah, just the names of each perk. Yeah, just kind of like in a smaller font off to the side. Original Alpha, we had the same problem where she had so many perks. Like I ever wondered if they even came into play story-wise because they're not mentioned. 
Which is, it's a meta thing, but I would have, it would have been nice to see them actively utilized and to be reminded that she has them and therefore work in her so, benefit. I always thought that the perks were um, a reference to the major skills that were developed or used within the chapter, rather than as like some sort of power up or boost. Yeah, it's more like uh, Skyrim's version of uh, skills. Well, the more you do something, the better you are at it. So, like, if um, Murky, let's say, suddenly uh, stole lots of stuff, for example, in this chapter, <laughs> you would have uh, gotten a boost for that. Well, that's kind of what I mean. I never felt like in the original FOE story that her abilities actively made a difference. Like, uh, Pip's uh, exponential scale of going from Vault Dweller to Literal Killing Machine was pretty fast. For Murky, um, he now has, what, a silenced... Or, let me go look. At the end of Chapter 3, he gets a... Uh... Yeah, he gets a um, Runt of the Litter and a Shadow Canter. I would love to see it, like... Let's say in previous situations where he's been caught for sneaking around, if on the next chapter or following chapters, and those kind of same risk situations, it goes perfectly. Which I guess you could say it kind of did this chapter with his escape plan. I mean, it shouldn't go perfectly, but maybe he would get away with more than you think he would. He was close. <laughs> Think of it as a successful speech check. Yeah, there you, you go. Gain some experience and knows what to do elsewhere. I mean, he basically did the same sort of thing the previous chapter, lying to all kinds of people, ponies, and, you know, suffering for it. But this time, it's actually better. So, got a better outcome. So he stole some oatmeal, he stole a whip. He stole the whip. Um, he he makes a him. note about how DJ Pwn3 is going to be doing an all-day marathon of Wasteland Survival Tips, which he wants to take advantage of as he plans on going out into the Wasteland. She's he then steals the oatmeal. She's actively reading and going page by page the Wasteland Survival Guide. Marky doesn't know it's a she. That's true. You got me there. I forget in the in the main story, did she have like a a voice modulator or something? Oh, yeah, it was a spell. Ah. Yeah, it was the same spell that every other DJ Pwn three had used, save the original, of course, who sounded like that. Gotcha. I really like how he um, figured out in uh, the previous chapter that his plan is terrible. He cannot come up with any good plan, so instead he relies on uh, tips from DJ Ponfrey. So uh, I, I like how he f he's finally relying on other things and trying to utilize them. And this plan goes to a rousing success, sort of ish, better than you know. I'll stop. I mean. It plowing your way through the rest of the chapter there. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, I, no, I, it's, just, it's, I just really like this like chapter. Just like Murky did. <laughs> Plus, I mean, there isn't... Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but there isn't that much to talk about until he actually starts to execute his plan. Well, well, I mean... We're basically on it now. Yeah, I mean, he gets the cart job. He starts stealing pieces of metal for his, yep. bu for his bulletproof Murky armor. <laughs> Which um, is, of course, pulling the cart for Wicked Slit, or at least for her foundry. I'm surprised he hasn't been stealing a ton of shit up until this point. Because, like, according to him, he has so many opportunities just to be a little ragamuffin. Well, what's he going to do with it? I would, I would have, like, an... I, personally, would have decked out my little pigsty in just... Tin cans. I don't know. He doesn't have that much that he can <laughs> steal. That's of worth. Yeah. No, he could like trade it at the black market. 
uh, he could have done stuff. He could have gotten more food. He didn't even know the market existed until a couple days ago. He needs to get out more. He needs to socialize, make friends. Yeah. I mean, if he had been stealing stuff, he could have bought friendship. So, <laughs> that. I don't think yeah. Murthy, Murky's method of um, making friends through the bottom of other ponies' uh, horseshoes is a very sustainable method. I mean, it's worked so far. <laughs> He's not dead. I also like the tidbit about them placing bets on him. Yep, the uh, the slavers at the uh, loading bay making bets on how long it will take him to put the card up because he's so scrawny. It, it makes sense. What kind of fun can you have in the wasteland other than betting on how long it will take him to pull? Well, I mean, he's just everybody's... Um favorite source of entertainment, which is probably done well to preserve him. And then we get to the Thresher. The thing that I don't understand how it works. <laughs> I've, I just imagine it as some sort of giant metal machine with threads like right underneath it and barely enough space to squeeze in. And that's about it. Yeah, it was pretty confusing. A question I asked of um, Kairos that we kind of half answered is, like, um, we, well, we talked about the collection system. Uh, Kairos mentioned the collection's broken, correct? Um, yes, the collection system on the machine is broken. So that's why they send in slaves in there to collect the extra thread. But everything else apparently works properly fine. So A... Where is the thread coming from, and why can't you just collect it from that source? And B, where is the produced thread going, and why can't they collect it from that source too? Okay, so I think the word thresher is being used improperly here. Either that, or it is just a slave term for the fact that they're getting diced up, because everything that I can see about a thresher is a grinding machine. Carl, you are um, pushing slaves into a giant by <laughs> That kills people? <laughs> they tried to stop you. You also pushed them into a giant fan. <laughs> now, what I think is that this is actually a giant loom. And uh, the bits of twine and the strings that are mentioned are um, being braided into a rope. Because he talks about the machine making rope from threads. So... It would stand to reason that all of the individual threads are coming from individual spools. They're being sent down this machine, uh, the full length of the machine, and then the blades come out and they weave it into a cord or a rope so that way it has a lot more tensile strength and is actually useful. And then that gets collected at the back end of the machine on another large spool. That so the bits sense. of twine that they're collecting are the scraps that are falling from the individual lines and whatever is being scraped off as the um, the weaving blades move down the length of twine. Makes but again, there's, there's a better system for doing this. They could use something like a broom to reach under the under where the blades can't get and then just pull it out. They could just drop the floor down, literally dig through the floor until there's enough standing room for the small ponies or even full-sized ponies and then just push carts back and forth and literally sweep the stuff up like their current system is terribly inefficient but it's quick yeah and they don't care because they have expendable slaves yep so it's actually cheaper now why i know waste time dig now I know why Red Eye was buying slaves so quickly because he's just fucking murdering them in excess. Well, I think the people running the machine, the slavers per se, most of them are slavers by trade or former raiders kind of thing. They're not exactly the most educated, so they're not going to design a solution to the problem, especially when the only thing lost are a couple slave limbs or a couple slaves, so they don't really see it as a problem. 
It's Uh-oh. just another day in the job. So Murky's yeah. down there, uh, rolling under it like a roly-poly um, when somebody gets caught. And he does the heroic thing, goes back, and at the last second, I think, interesting note, if I remember correctly, he throws himself on top of the pony. Yeah, he does. To protect them. To try and shield them. And somebody else gets caught in that last moment. Mm. Um, that person is rewarded with a tiny piece of uh, lead and uh, escorted off to their new uh, holding chamber. Which is the uh, large pit out back. I'm surprised in that moment when um, his vest gets ripped open and he's dragging the slave out back that he doesn't just take this dead slave's vest. Did the dead well, slave have a vest? Ah. Well, he has a lot of respect for the dead. Yeah, he has a weird amount of respect for the dead. I have a lot of respect for a pair of new boots. <laughs> I mean, if he was if he was a sociopath, he probably would be doing a lot better for himself. But He's too sentimental for that. Reminds me of um, Fallout 3 when you could go to um, Paradise Falls, the literal place of slavers who are killing, beating, and just like overall being terrible. But if you take some of the whiskey from one of their houses, it's considered stealing. <laughs> Not stealing that gives you a karma loss, interestingly enough. That's actually in the game. But still stealing. But just like recognized by other people as stealing. Yeah. Huh. That makes sense. It just works. I think there are some parts in Fallout 3 where it's a karma loss, and you're like, why the fuck do I lose karma for that? These are terrible people. They don't need this whiskey. But why do you need the whiskey? It's like the age-old uh, philosophical problem. If you could go back in time, um, but your time machine messes up, and you find Hitler when he's like 20 years old, and you have the opportunity to steal his wallet, would you steal his wallet? What is that going to change? Well, he's gonna like lose fifteen Deutschmarks. You're I mean minorly inconveniencing him. But in that scenario, do you look Jewish? Because if you do and he catches you, you're only making things worse. <laughs> you started all of it. Hitler's deep-seated anger was over a Jewish person, Jewish time traveler <laughs> stealing his wallet. Not even a Jewish time traveler, just someone who vaguely resembled a person of Jewish descent who traveled back in time and stole this wallet. <laughs> hey, Hitler, I keep telling you the time-traveling Jews are not going to steal your wallet again. I'm telling you. So off of that topic, um, what happens next? He drags the dead slave, steals some thread. Apparently it's just a whole fuck ton of thread, otherwise I'm like mistaking Yeah. Yeah. Just how much he takes, and also he can sew really well, or he's making like super makeshift clothes. I mean, I don't know does it mention somewhere where he gets the rest of the fabric from? Apparently he just grab some off of the ground well I mean in a in a weaving mill or um, in a mechanical weaver you're not going to have big pieces of fabric you're only going to have the individual threads which are then being braided unless this is an actual um, like textile machine at which point it's making a sheet of fabric it's weaving sheets of fabric but at that point they would be like uh, burlap Maybe there was another machine with more slaves just producing that fabric nearby. Maybe they had other um, looms, other mechanical looms. That's the word I'm looking for. Maybe it's a MacGuffin. No, because he has fleece. His um, his outfit is very specifically noted as being fleece. So he he has to get that from somewhere. He is he's inhaled. Not weaving it. He's inhaled so much thread from rolling around at the thrasher that he can just cough it up, like a there you go. like a cat, like a mummy, or a mummy, a cat mummy. 
I didn't know that mummies could cough up fabric. <laughs> Airballs. Enough. So he gets some of that, and he wanders off to the top of somewhere, if I remember correctly. Uh, ba -da -ba -ba. Uh, the top of the... Yep. Phonic not the funicular, the, the other thing I forgot. The Helter the Skelter? Yeah, that. Which is a big slide. I think that's it. Yeah, it's the um, the massive fun slide in the in Pinky's Fun Farm. If I could just, for the life of me, get the name of it. Then he, then he notes the um, conspiracy surrounding the metal crates. Oh yeah. We get our second dialogue entry from um, Sun Dila, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And no, sundial. Sundila and. <laughs> uh, Murky is talking to somebody long dead. More like listening, though. Well, I mean, he says hello back, and then he says goodbye at the end. Also, I believe it's uh, I believe it's pronounced uh, soon, uh, Dial. Sundial. Sundial. It's interesting how he has so much respect for the dead, however, he still takes the pit butt. I think he's justifying that because it's a coping mechanism and lets him hear um, songs and advice and makes him feel less lonely. Well, he does say that um, he thinks that it, other ponies would like break it or sell it. Or he's, abuse it. He's cherishing it. Why not just hide it? Where would where would you hide a pit bug? In one of the crates. <laughs> they all look uh, scary similar, so it could take someone a while to find it, even if they knew it was in a metal crate. That does. What a bad plan. That does remind me of Fallout Three, with just so many fucking metal boxes everywhere. Hundreds upon thousands of metal boxes full of random crap. Also perfectly preserved coffee cups. Oh, that was a funny as hell note. I I actively like burst out laughing when um he goes by one of the uh, carnival games and the rigged um bottles that you have to shoot are still stacked. Oh Even yeah, after yeah, the glass bottles. bottles are there, yes. <laughs> So this is the audio log. Nothing too interesting in that, other than um, Sundiale uh, <laughs> uh, worked for the wartime of Ministry Technology. The Ministry of Wartime Technology. There we go. Brain. Um, and then he basically outfits himself and prepares to go. Gear up. Yeah, that's that's the. Word I was looking for. I fully expected him just to like do all of that, step outside, immediately get caught by slavers, beaten down, stripped, and then the next I part mean, of the book would have stopped, stepped in. Not too far off, but I just thought about it. Um, he said he got dark fabric from the threshing mill. It's possible though it doesn't mechanically make sense with what was described for the machine, that there is actually a thresher there. And what they're doing is stripping the uh, old clothes off of the slaves, the old rags and tatters. They're actually throwing them into a thresher to grind them up, and then they're weaving those using a different machine, kind of like recycling the fabric, to make um, new clothes and or cloth. Cold bullet, you're supposed to take the clothes off before you throw the slave in. Oh, darn. <laughs> I mean, assumingly, they're taking the uh, the clothing from the dead slaves to recycle it. Probably also the live ones. Eh, I don't know. The slavers might get cruel and abuse it, but I don't think that I would have ordered that so 
he makes double layered clothes with enough like capacity to put the metal blocks in sheets. Yeah, just kind of like pockets. Makes a holster for his knife. Makes a knife, then makes a holster for his knife, and then makes a knife holster. Yep, and, and he sews pockets onto his fleece. And bungee jump, or, and it's the whip, but I just thought of it like a bungee cord. Uses the whip for um the pit buck. Yeah, that is actually a terrible idea, by the way. You would cut your uh, blood circulation off really bad if you did that. How do we know that Murky has blood circulation? That's true. He probably has sludge, given how irradiated he is. Is he going to go ghoul? I hope so. That would be an interesting twist. At the end, like, towards the end of the book, he goes ghoul. And um, so all of the, the major problems that he has to deal with of being out in the wastes alone are no longer relevant. And then immediately, they uh, they fix everything. And so it's impossible for him to survive as a ghoul. He was very close to becoming a ghoul this chapter, apparently. No, I think he was just close to dying. So it's he... funny. It, it's funny, though. I mean, the Wasteland would hate him even more if he was a ghoul pegasus. I mean, I don't know if they would hate him more, per se, because at that point they could think he's pre-war. Hey, no, Which is even worse. People love Derpy Hooves the ghoul. Well, she's People different. do, but ponies hate her. So he um, starts sneaking around, uh, almost gets caught, hides in the drain, chased by rad roaches. And, uh, oh yeah, he gets bitten by rad roaches. <laughs> Four rad roaches is greater than one murky in terms of overall combat strength, as we learn. Oh, a lot. Legendary rad roaches. And here's, um, here's flutters in the air. Which it, um, I will admit at first I thought immediately was like a sprite bot, because it does note before, or at some point in this chapter, um, that a sprite bot looks at him confused. See him? Yeah, I, I think that was a reference to Watcher. Yeah, yeah very much so, because it was the only quiet sprite bot he'd ever seen. Surprised it hasn't um, talked to him at all yet. Though I suppose it doesn't, like, and Watcher isn't too concerned with all the slaves. Nope, just kind of keeping tabs. But I mean, here's a flutter, sneaks into a house full of uh, dead ponies. Manages. Manages to hide. Yeah, manages to outwit them by opening a window. It, it did note that he opened the window too before he got into the cupboard, and I'm like, what? What does that matter? Not like that. You didn't immediately realize it was a ploy to throw them off. No, I thought he just wanted to. Get some fresh air. Gentle breeze. I mean, it was probably kind of stuffy in there. The family would have enjoyed it. What does that smell like? 200 years, all like? of the corpses are now skeletons. Does this, I, I imagine it still has a certain smell. I mean, given the nature of how they died, being so close to the center of a radioactive crater, I would assume it just smells like dust. Kind of like a sick grime. Was not anything that you would like distinctly think of with um, dead or burned bodies, because I mean they would like the radiation would have eaten everything away. So I'm pretty sure all basic all ma biological materials already you know disintegrated or something by then. Was Philadelphia the first hit, or was that? Um, the Cloudsdale, first hit okay. was Cloudsdale. Cloudsdale. There was Everything the one. Everything else came after that. There was also the one where the zebras snuck a bomb. Or was that Cloudsdale? Because I remember some of them were fired and some of them were like actively snuck. Yeah, some places. of them were bombs and some of them were like closer to missiles. I would assume. But um, I know they snuck the one bomb. They had to sneak one into Cloudsdale. I think. I don't think that one was fired. I think they actually got it up there somehow and detonated it. I thought that was fired and they snuck a bomb into Manhattan. I 
think they did sneak one into Manhattan. There's, of course, the the Canterlot bomb, which they had snuck in well ahead of time. Oh, yeah. And then maybe they did fire on uh, Cloudsdale. I mean, otherwise, why create the cloud curtain? It's to protect from the missile. I thought it was, just, thought it was cool. just a reaction to the attack to make sure that none of their other cities could get hit. By protecting them from missiles. Well, okay. But protecting them from everything, but... Yeah, but what are clouds going to do too. against really big rocks? I mean, if the clouds are strong enough to support the weight of a pegasus, who knows? They might yeah. be a lot tougher than they look. The weight of Raymadash's ego is pretty heavy. <laughs> Actually, in FOE, they have the dreadnoughts that are, you know, part, I'm assuming, metal ship and part cloud. So they might be able to lift a considerable amount of stuff if applied properly. Hmm. So... The raiders pass him by, and he goes and tries to sneak into the Thresher crowd, and is immediately accosted by raiders who want to take his stuff. Yeah, that was yep. a stupid, stupid mistake. This is where he hears the second flutter. They uh, they try to rob him, just kind of like in broad daylight, which I suppose is just a thing raiders can do. Slavers. Oh, I'm sorry. Two terms are Yeah, synonymous. definitely slavers. No. Seriously, though, kids, slipping in uh, as a slave is not a good idea. Dressed all in black. Stuck... No, yeah, first of all, you dressed all in black, snuck in as a slave with all your stuff, and then you're at the mercy of those because they'll keep a watchful eye on slaves. It's not a good idea. He has goggles on and a giant rucksack. Oh, yeah, Dressed in all black. Mm. I love, I loved how he stole the goggles. <laughs> it's hilarious. And you can probably see like the metal plates through the fabric, unless they're like really, really thin. But you would, you would see something bulky on this tiny little slave. He, Murky is drug running. Uh, Giant packs of cocaine, and they are easily visible <laughs> through <laughs> through the fabric. Would that make him a drug mule? I suppose a it drug would. Pegasus. Yeah, that was that was the joke. Was uh was horse race? Is Marky a real Pegasus if his wings are like, broken as hell? See, like this is why you were supposed to read chapter four. Basically, just an Earth pony now. <laughs> Um, gets caught and decides to book it, and he gets a raider eaten by the thresher. Slavery. Yes, he does. They get tangled. Well, yeah, the um, him and the slaver get tangled up in the lines that it's braiding, and so as it heads towards them, he cuts himself free with his handy utility knife, and the uh, slaver does not. The slave didn't know he was in his playing ground. I don't think Berkey knew he was in his own playground either. He got he had to cut himself free. Yeah, but he had more experience in Dell. So... Advent. To his credit, Murky did a considerable amount less panicking than the uh, the slaver did. I Until, just... of course, his friends bust in through the um, exit doors and begin unloading with an auto pistol. I realized Murky has made a prison shiv. Yes, <laughs> he did. He has yet to shank anyone, but he has made a shiv. So he's trying to run, bullets are being fired at him. And he basically jumped into the pit of dead bodies. 
Well, he ran up on the catwalk first, and then they shot at him, and then they dropped the entire catwalk on top of the thresher machine, oh, completely yeah, that. destroying the thresher machine. Then he gets up on the roof and jumps into the, the pit of bodies. Cannonball! Then he um, hides under some bodies, makes himself all cozy, all warm and snug like a blanket. Yeah. Finally, some other physical contact that doesn't hurt. <laughs> okay. Murky gets his first hug from a corpse. <laughs> but um, Rish, take what you can get. Raiders shoot the bodies and just immediately give up and wander off. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were not very interested in doing their job, I guess. But I suppose I like, mean, they were they were looking for him in case he escaped elsewhere. They can't spend too much time just staring at the pit. And none of them are going to start swimming around in it like Murky is. Plus, they had a whole bunch of other slaves to look after. Yeah, everybody was panicking inside after the the catwalk got dropped on the machine. So that and half of the slavers went charging out down the line of slaves. That would. So I'm sure it was a mess in there. That's an interesting tally to keep. Let's keep a tally of things that should get Murky uh, executed. So one got to kill the raider and the thresher. Two destroyed the thresher. Um, there's also trying to escape, which is punishable Ste by death. Stealing from a, a raider and a raid captain. I'm just gonna keep using the term raider. Slave yeah. raid bird? Yeah, it's Slave okay. Man. We're gonna we're gonna smack you really hard um, in <laughs> chapter four for all that. But. See, I'm just going to keep alluding to it. That's your punishment. You'll never know. He starts crawling towards the, um... Uh, Slater camp. And... Actively running between their tents, causing little mischief. Before the klaxons I... start whirring. Yeah, I don't think he made it in there very far before they sounded the alarm. Why did they sound the alarm for one slave? I have to imagine this operation has like thousands of these fuckers. It's got to be happening so, on a daily basis, right? Probably not. And the only reason I would say that is because the layout of uh, Philadelphia is there's the big wall, the you know massive guarded wall, the moat, and then the slaver camps right inside the wall. So you've got three barriers in between anyone and their escape. So that's that's going to be a pretty huge deterrent. Most of the slaves are going to be uh, managed in their respective holding areas. That's why they do the roll call. So they'll know pretty quick when someone's out of place. They've got a lot of little things set up to keep them in line. And even then, if they did get past the wall and the moat, and they didn't get shot by the snipers, they wouldn't have a whole lot, and they might not have a you know a direction to head in. So there's just there's not a whole lot going for them, even if they make it out, in order for them to survive. So. Still, though, they it's... should have, like, localized uh, sort of alarms, other than one giant one for everything. Well, he did break the so... thresher to play devil's at devil's kit. And it's hard to say that every alarm in the city is going off, and not just the alarms in the slaver camp, which they would alert the entire slaver camp if they had to run away, because they're going to have to run through the slaver camp to get out. True. I'm surprised they spot them so fast. They're like, ah, that one right there. Oh, well, basically to be fair, he, yeah, he charges through like a dinner party. A, I think it is actually a dinner table. And he just barrels through the area after the alarm sounds because he says it's too late. 
If he had, like, stolen a gun and then walked confidently, I wonder if he could have pulled it off. I don't think so. He he is not made of slave material. Plus, his cutie mark doesn't help him. I don't know. I don't think he could have pulled it off just because he's murky and he would have been fumbling and stammering. But... I think if he had taken a gun and... I don't know. He probably wouldn't have been able to use it very well either. So, I don't know if it would have helped him. I think he could have run uh, not right in front of them and that would delay them a few minutes. Yeah, he could have definitely tried to preserve... Uh you know, his advantage just by not letting them know exactly where he was until the last possible minute. So then he basically charges up the wall. Yep, he makes a mad dash and nobody can hit him because he is tiny. I don't even think the armor takes any more of the... uh any more of the shots, they just all outright miss him as he hides in the shadow of the wall in his dark clothing with his tiny stature. I think uh, one shot hit him and bounced off one of the middle plates. Uh, that was on his um, attempt to get to the Thresher Mill roof. It was shortly right. after he made it up and they fired through the ceiling. So that's good. Mm -hmm. It can at least deflect a single pistol around. Better than nothing. Yeah, it's, it's a lot better than nothing. So basically, he's making a dash for the wall and gets shot by Regini. <laughs> yep. Brigaga? No. Uh, Heard a flutter in the sky. Do do. Jet Black Griffin with long-barreled rifle hovering in the air. He should have looked up every once in a while. I mean, to be fair, she also has the um, the dark camouflage. And, and he was the light in her. the day sky? Well, it's bleak afternoon. And... Fallout Equestria, which is already under cloud cover, and then on top of that, it's all in the Philadelphia smog. So, I, I forgot about all that. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, there's there's a lot more in the air, which makes me uh, wonder about the the healthcare plan for Griffins, considering that they're probably flying through and breathing a lot of that smog. But. Well, just drink a health potion. No, that, 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 I mean, it's not going to fix the radiation part of the problem. Then drink some the other way. When you shoot enemies with a low enough health in the Fallout series, they uh, vaporize. Would shooting Murky cause them to instantly vaporize? Yes. There's no room for debate there. If he gets hit by an energy anything, he's just a puddle. Personally, I just, I really enjoy this chapter mainly because of how he sits and listens to the tips from DJ Ponfrey and basically plans everything. And every single time he has to deviate from his plan, he gets something wrong. He is not capable of getting any plan by himself. Well, he's not capable of um, like a judgment call when things aren't exactly as he um, kind of conceived that they would go. Have we gone over Protégé yet? Not yet. No, we have not. That is the very tail end of the chapter. So he gets shot, waking up in uh, captivity, and he meets uh, a handsome stallion that was Dreams, Protégé, who monologues, him as all, monologues at him as all villains do. Um, this guy is distinctly a representative of the middle class, uh, trying to look at basically the worker class in a 
that the light bud is actually doesn't understand that he's still actively depressing them and keeping them in place with uh, shackles, which represents how they're still, you know, keeping them, keeping everything in, in place. There's no class mobility here. It's all an analog about capitalism. Wait, the middle class gets like cool fucking uh, hyper futuristic eye monocles. I was yeah, I was the, not the middle class this. is the working class. Cough and slaves. Um, no, no, slavers in this case would be middle class. Slaves would be the poor class, and then yeah, the aristocracy or yeah, rich he's definitely class. aristocracy. In my mind, I thought that yeah, I was the aristocracy. Yep, I was confused. You are correct. Protege right, so... is like is is the uh, protege is the Twilight Sparkle to Red Eyes Celestia kind of thing. Like they're they're both in the same category of being at the top of the social food chain, more or less. They're the VIPs. So if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I read FOE. So I read it in, I think, a week back in like high school. Um, isn't all of Red Eye's stuff about Unity basically bullshit, profiteering bullshit, or was most of no. it true? No, no, it's no. it's one hundred percent true. Because I still remember about his like he had deals with Unity and all that jazz in the background. Yes, he did because he was. Uh, plotting her demise. Like, everything that he did was to put uh, to put a spin on things to eventually rebuild um, to rebuild Equestria under different leadership and a different ruler that wasn't entirely himself. Not to spoil the uh, entire you know, back half of the plot of Fallout Equestria, but don't don't worry. Um, we were putting that the fact that there's Fallout Quest Three spoilers in the description. Uh, I'm also pretty sure anyone who had who read or wants to start reading Moki has already read Fallout Quest Three. Probably. I have met some people who have only read Project Horizons and not FOE. What? I don't. Yeah, I don't understand it. Why? What is their opinion of uh, Project Horizons? Um, so most of the people I've met, m most of the people I've met typically have a high opinion of Project Horizons. Um, a lot of people, I won't, I won't devalue their appreciation of the novel, but I, most of the people who are critical of Project Horizons do note a wild shift in story and writing quality of, of a, an exact point in Project Horizons. Like, literally, there's an exact chapter that they point to, they say the sh the story changed radically and they did not like it. I think it was like chapter 30. 33, I believe. That's yeah. the, there's a very, very large uh, plot uh, device thing. To my understanding, oh. the beginning of Project Horizons is absolutely amazing, and then the later half turns into, as I've heard it described, Dragon Ball Z. Pretty much. Now, it still sounds wonderfully interesting to me, but... Um, I haven't read it, so I can't say... I'd like to give it a fair shake one day. That was actually an idea that, um, for anyone who's actually listening to this, Chris uh, proposed that after we finish with Murky and they finish with uh, the next book they're going to read, I'm not sure if it's been announced, um, that we all do Project Horizons together. Yay, good luck, more scheduled good luck reading. scheduling that. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, it'll be five years in the future because Murky is a really big book. <laughs> I don't know, we could just... Um push three chapters from now on. Because <laughs> oh two worked out so well. But, um... What was our topic before that? I have met people... Capitalism. Capitalism. Bourgeoisie. Uh, Protégé? Protégé, yeah, there you go. Protege monologues him for a little bit, and Murky immediately questions all of his life values since he's easily impressionable. And Protege says, uh, if you had gone through that grate, you would have been like rolling around in super goop and you would have died. Yeah. I 
wonder how truthful that is, but at the same time, if the gate was, like, that unguarded and he could have slipped in, it probably was just a toxic death pit. Yeah. And you, he continued without so much as a breath, were about to crawl into a drainage tunnel filled with tainted chemicals that would have killed you in moments in a rather distasteful way. I personally believe Potter J, he has sort of a good heart, uh, but he's slightly misguided and or at least born into the situation where he's trying to make the best of it. He says with innumerable foresight. Shush. Um, but yeah, I can easily see that, especially on the edge of Philadelphia, which was hit with a uh, bomb directly and has a massive radioactive crater, that there would be trace amounts of taint. Well, Murky's just a big old dummy because usually I would just open my pit boy and start swallowing Radix and Radaway, like you know tomorrow. Well, I mean, all he had to do was read the sign that said, you know, toxic drainage, but. Don't those signs usually have pictures? Bother with that. Like a skull? You can't read. You can't, no, that, that's, that doesn't work. So at the end of the chapter, um, the master comes back and says, uh, hey there, cutie pie, and he's actually carrying a maid outfit as he walks into the room. <laughs> and um, Marky shivers in terror at the return of his new life. Wow, he actually does say, hey there, cutie pie. <laughs> uh, no no maid outfit, but yeah. I hey tell there, the truth, cutie nothing pie. but the truth. Maybe I got a wrong copy, Miss Print? No. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, it looks like somebody uh, drew here with... Person. Looks like somebody drew here with pen, but I'm I'm not too sure. I wonder who would do such a thing. <laughs> Does it look like your handwriting? <laughs> if it was, I wouldn't be able to tell regardless. I take a picture. And... and then write it out next to it and we can compare. So the end of the chapter is just that, and he gets two perks, uh, run of the litter, which means um when he gets the crappy out of him he has a small damage resist to melee attacks. And Shadow Canter, which is plus in a sneak, and deaths are twice as likely to succeed. That is broken. This yeah yeah that yeah. that that perk is absolutely broken. The balance here is all off. OP, please no. Only level three. Come on. Is he level three? I don't think it said level up. If I remember. Ooh. If I remember correctly. So anyway, I really enjoyed this chapter. Like, it was super fun watching him devising a plan, then deviating from it and failing horribly. And just, uh, I described it previously as in text as delightful, and I still stand by it. I... I... Go ahead. I actually thought it was kind of dry. Um, not to say that it was bad, but that it, it certainly was less gripping. Um, he did a lot more kind of internal fuddling and less, um, you know, interacting with the world around him. I thought it was okay. I definitely wanted to see him get out of Philadelphia, but I understand that's the whole point of the book, is that he's going to be here forever. I said it was going to take a long time, and I'm glad he didn't make it out, because that means I'm not wrong yet. I also think there were a lot of missed opportunities to be absolutely cruel, but I'm just edgy. Um, I would give it a nice... We'll say, uh, I'll say, I'll say seven... Kairos? Um, I think I'm going to give this one a four. Whoa. And... Well, let's see. My last one... My last one was what? A seven? I think so. And the one before that was a six, right? Probably. Because I liked it. I liked chapter two more than I liked... Um, I think chapter you gave it a one. four or five. No, the chapter one. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh, no. By yeah. what? What's the Reddit quote 
I rate it five out of seven. Uh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Seven out of seven of five. I'm gonna I'm gonna give this one a four, and that's because I when I when I'm given a one to ten scale, I usually only use one to nine. Because 10 is perfect, and nothing is ever perfect, and I, I never grant anyone a 10 for anything. But for you. But, Why aren't huh? you just a cute little philosopher? No. Okay. Uh, fine. The point being is that 5 is average, dead center, and so 4 is just below average. If you were to so take... It's not, it's not terrible. If you were to take like a muddy cardboard box and a hobo has been living in it, and this hobo is a scatophile, and he's just been like kind of covering it with his own excrement, and you slapped a pony sticker on it, I would rate that thing an 8. Um, I would like to say this is wildly off-topic for, for a book review, but... <laughs> it's why I gave it a 7. For I'm our book pleased. review, I'm not sure. <laughs> I am easily pleased as long as it is pony. What about you, Yas? What would you give it? I think it was really good. Yeah. Can you break? Give me a, give me the number. I don't think he has no. yet. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you down as as a as a eight point five. I'll put you down as an eight point five. I might give him an eight point seven. That's just heresy. Do we have any uh, closing remarks? Any closing ideas, thoughts, topics? Um. You want my thoughts on on chapter four? <laughs> I could I could give you some uh, some so, thoughts for what might happen in chapter four. If we didn't mention it last podcast, we wanted to catch up and read two chapters. Yas and um, Kairos diligently let, read both chapters. I read one of them, and then I had to pick up an extra work shift, and I uh, I did not read it. I'm I'm very sorry and sad to you. I came close to failing, so don't feel that bad. I came very, very close if to I, giving it up. If I literally had a few extra hours, I could have read it, but... Scheduling. I, mean, I spent my oh, entire day yesterday catching up. Uh, same. I pretty much finished it yesterday, and you know, I started it the day before. I read, um... We're, we're not very good at time management. How do you guys read so fast? Took me three days. <laughs> I have a book to show you. It's called Way of Kings. Uh, I'll read that. Uh, that Smash Bros. fan fiction, longest oh. written work in human history. Not human history, but longest in the English language. I think that should be something we do. We read. Um, we read both Project Horizons and the Smash Bros. fanfic. And we have to rate which ones were. <laughs> um, I feel like the Smash Bros. fanfic would get better. You know, halfway through, because the whole point was to teach him to write, right? Uh, yeah. di di disclaimer: None of us have read Project Horizons. I'm sure Project Horizons is wonderful, hey. and the common meme is just a rag on it. I read half of it. Excuse you. Why did you stop reading half? Halfway through. Because I was, uh, I read it as it was being, you know, published oh. chapter by chapter, oh. and eventually I just. Stop because I forgot everything that happened previously. At BronyCon, they were selling full seven copy um, volume sets. For I think. Oh, now you're disparaging people who didn't get to go. Book one. Those people were plebeians. We don't associate with them. I mean, given the relative sphere of interest, maybe. <laughs> That should be something that that would actually be a an interesting uh, idea. I'll have to pose to um, Chris, maybe uh, me, you, um, our fourth party member, and uh, Chris could get together and we could talk about our BronyCon experiences. That would actually I'm be a sad wonderful right idea. <laughs> I'm so sorry, yes. See, this is what I was talking about disparaging, and uh, you're never gonna get that that outlier in to comment on his BronyCon experiences. I'm sure I could like wave a cookie in front of his face or something, and then uh, we could. Dogpile them and tie them up the last second. No, put, it's, a, put a mic in front of him. It's not gonna work. He'll just right. foam and froth the mouth and then derail the conversation over and over again. <laughs> not my, even my, intentionally. My BonyCon experience has been, I mean, can be summarized as sadness. 
and sad uwu. Exactly. The saddest. Don't worry, Yas, it's only never happening ever again. Well, anyways, <laughs> come to Trotcon. Anyways, come to Trotcon. Oh, it was glorious. We, we, we were hearing people several times yell about, we, okay, we really need to do that podcast. That would be a great podcast. Just a one-off? Yeah, just kind of sitting around talking about it for a few hours. I'm sure people would be more than interested to hear it. I'm going to go message Chris about that right now. But to wrap it up, I um, think that's it. They covered everything. Uh, any final thoughts? Like, shoot it out if you want. Uh, I hope we get some some uh, development on number six and or get to see him again. That would be cool. As well as some more uh, interactions with Father J. Don't spoil it for me, but I thought that number six was going to be a part of the vault raiding crew, but I don't know yet. I don't know if he originally was or not. <laughs> I have no idea. Just didn't make it out during the raid or something. Um, but I think that um, that does it for this episode. Uh, thank you all for listening, if you have listened to this far. And we'll see you next time. Hopefully with... um, Are we going to try to shoot for Chapter 4 and 5 next time? We could. Are you sure you want to you wanna go through with this? Uh, I'll try. We'll see. Anyways. All right, yeah. We'll play it by ear. Uh, goodbye. This is this was your host, uh, Vex, with my other host, uh, Kairos. And Yas. Howdy. He says hello. Oh, Lord. <laughs>